Welcome to the 16th annual State of Indian Nations. We're so happy that you could join us here today in the Knights Studio in the Museum in Washington, D.C. Kusin Yohatu Asak, Suka Adi Ayahat, Kagwantan Yadi Yehidak. That's my Clinket name um, and, who, and who, the clan that I come from, the Raven Clan. My English name is Jacqueline Peta, and I'm the Executive Director of the National Congress of American Indians, the oldest, largest, and most representative American Indian and Alaska Native organization, serving the broad interest of tribal governments and our communities. As part of our effort to further the goals of Indian country, NCAI brings together tribal leaders, government officials, and members of Congress to discuss the challenges, the opportunities, and the solutions faced by our communities. And that's what we're here today is all about. We have a full house today of tribal leaders, senior federal officials, students, organizational partners, and some of our strongest allies who are dedicated to working together on issues facing Indian country. We thank the pe people of Piscataway for allowing us to be on your lands today. And I want to welcome Piscataway Chief James Jesse Swan and the Turtle Clan Mother for being here with us. Thank you. I want to welcome each of you who are attending the State of Indian Nations in person and give our thanks to those thousands who are watching or listening to events all over the country and around the world. Watch parties have been organized across the nation to join live stream. And this year we have doubled the amount of watch parties from the previous year. One of our great corporation partners, Walmart, is even streaming the State of Indian Nations to their employees at their headquarters. And in 16 years, the National Indian Gaming Association has never missed a single State of Indian Nations. Thank you, Ernie. I want to welcome our partners from Congress and the administration who are here with us today. We are also joined by many members of the NCAI board who represent all regions across the country. I also want to recognize our future leaders here in Washington, D.C. by welcoming the students from so many colleges and education programs. We want to congratulate Chief Ann Richardson of the Rappahannock Tribe here with us today, one of the six Virginia tribes who were granted federal recognition on January 29th. And finally, finally, we want to extend our thanks to Senator Tom Udall, who will be joining us to provide the congressional response. If you are posting on social media about the State of Indian Nations today, please use our hashtag, SOIN 2018. We can capture and answer questions using this hashtag, so send your questions our way. It's now my pleasure to introduce the 22nd President of the National Congress of American Indians, Jefferson Keel, to deliver the State of Indian Nations Address. President Keel was elected President of NCAI from October 2009 to 2013. He was re-elected as NCAI's President in October 2017. Jefferson Keel is serving his fifth term as Lieutenant Governor of the Chickasaw Nation. President Keel is a living example of an honorable public, of honorable public service. He is a former Airborne Ranger and an Army officer, serving over 20 years of active duty. He represents Indian Country on countless boards and committees and is a fierce warrior for tribal sovereignty. Please join me in welcoming our NCAI President, Jefferson Keel. Chikma. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you for being here, and I'm honored and humbled to serve you once again as the President of the National Congress of American Indians. Normally, at this point, I'd say on behalf of the 567 federally recognized tribal nations and dozens of state-recognized tribal nations that we serve, I'm honored to welcome you here today. But last month, six Virginia tribes were finally granted federal recognition. I congratulate the Chickahominy, Eastern Chickahominy, Upper Mattaponi, Rappahannock, Monacan, and the Nansimone tribes 
on this long overdue affirmation of their sovereignty. <laughs> So now, on behalf of the 573 federally recognized tribal nations and dozens of state recognized tribal nations that we serve, I'm honored to share this message of our power and purpose with members of Congress and the administration. The state of Indian nations is strong and resilient and everlasting. We were here before all others. We're still here. We will always be here. <clears throat> like so many others, my tribe, the Chickasaw, was removed from our home in Mississippi in the 1830s. We were uprooted from our homes, driven hundreds of hard miles across the rivers and mountains, enduring unmentionable hardship losing almost half of our tribal members to what is now known as Oklahoma. There, we started over. We rebuilt our nation. Our love of our culture and our commitment to our values kept us strong and enabled us to persevere. Today, we proudly call ourselves the unconquered and unconquerable Chickasaw Nation. and we are among the strongest economic drivers and forces in Oklahoma. In every part of this land, we see the enduring resilience of Native peoples. We're a wellspring of governing ingenuity and local solutions to tough challenges, indigenous knowledge and environmental stewardship, and new jobs and economic growth. Yet too often, and for too long, Indian country has been overlooked. This must end. Indian nations have weathered every conceivable storm. We've overcome in the face of unthinkable challenges to our lives and our ways of life. We've stood steadfast in the face of policies meant to disperse and distinguish us. Today, we say with one voice, we have inherent rights. Not only were we born with them, we've earned them. the right to be recognized as equal governments, the right to be seated at the table where key decisions are made, the right to contribute as much to America's future just as we are contributing to its present. We are at a moment, an important moment. Our governments and our communities stand on high alert. For too many years, the echoes of America's colonial past have continued to reverberate disparaging rhetoric, failed policies, a disregard for the inherent sovereignty of tribal nations. This is unacceptable. Our message for our representatives in government is this, respect our rights. See us as equal partners and uphold the federal government's trust responsibility to tribal nations. Do so not on your own terms, but on the terms as they have been defined by hundreds of treaties, policies, and legal precedent. That is our standard. That is a non-negotiable condition of our support at the polls on Election Day. Far too often, people seem to forget just how, how profoundly Native peoples have influ influenced the world in which we all live today in developing agriculture and building infrastructure, in managing lands and natural resources, in governing and solving shared community challenges. We are, and always have been, innovators and leaders. I want to touch on a few of these topics, starting with the food Native people put on our tables. From wild rice and bison to salmon and blueberries, Traditional native foods are not only our way of life, but are an economic driver also. Indian agriculture is a $3.2 billion industry, supporting nearly 
72,000 jobs in Indian country. And in 2018, no farm bill should pass unless it includes our priorities to recognize tribal governments as sovereigns and to strengthen Indian country's agricultural potential. Native peoples are also builders and managers of roads and bridges <clears throat> and other essential infrastructure. These projects are often in rural areas. They connect tribal and surrounding communities with each other and with the rest of the nation. Tribal infrastructure is American infrastructure. In 2018, no infrastructure bill should pass unless it includes Indian country's priorities. <clears throat> it must offer us the same opportunities to raise capital as state and local governments, invest adequate, equitable funding in our infrastructure needs, and remove barriers to us from making decisions at the local tribal level. Reaffirm our right to consent to developments that affect our lands and our people. And in doing so, ensure every community has the infrastructure to thrive in our shared 21st century America. Native peoples are also innovators. Long before we conducted trade with newcomers, starting in 1492, by the way, Native peoples had woven a complex web of international commerce. The Tanaotham Nation was one of many nations to establish a network of trade routes that spanned the entire Southwest. Similarly, when Lewis and Clark arrived on the shores of the Pacific Ocean, they saw the same tools with the same symbols that they had seen in what is now North Dakota. Today, Tribes continue to serve as economic engines across this continent. The Chickasaw Nation and other tribes in Oklahoma contribute billions of dollars to the state and local economies every year. In Arizona, Native businesses generate hundreds of millions of tax dollars and pay $1.9 billion in wages to tens of thousands of Native and non-Native employees. In Mississippi, the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians provides 6,000 full-time jobs through its, through its diverse array of businesses, more than half of which are held by non-natives. It also has reinvested over $500 million of its profits in economic development projects across the state. Not only do these jobs often pay more than other jobs, they're not going anywhere. You're never going to read about how they're being moved overseas. Because native businesses don't pull up stakes, even when market conditions change. We root our businesses in local communities for good. <clears throat> you want to buy American? Then do business with Indian country. And when tribal economies prosper, surrounding communities prosper. To that end, Congress and the administration should adopt the measures that tribal governments have deemed critical to spurring economic development. Remove the outdated burdens placed on native businesses, starting with the ones that require us to go to the federal government for permits that tribes could readily furnish. Remove obstacles barring from tribes from accessing and leveraging capital. Pass the Tribal Labor Sovereignty Act, which affirms, <clears throat> which affirms our right to determine our own labor regulations, just as city, county, and state governments are allowed to do. We have the right to build our own economic futures on our own lands, on our own terms. When it comes to our lands and resources, Native people were the original conservationists. Long before the first churches and cathedrals were erected in America, we held relationships of faith and reverence with sacred places across this land. Today, 
we must work to preserve the sanctity of these places and in some cases restore access to them so that they can continue to provide cultural and spiritual sustenance. Those who argue for privatization of our lands believe that granting individual property rights will fuel economic development. However, they ignore the impact it would have on our sovereign authority to protect our homelands, economies, and cultural resources for future generations. For these, gener for these reasons, it's critical that land policies be developed with tribes from the outset through true consultation and dialogue on a government-to-government -government basis. We say to policymakers, we've cared for this place for the millennia. Seek our time-honored indigenous knowledge and expertise. Recognize our role and value in managing these lands to prevent costly mistakes and produce better outcomes. We must remove the barriers that keep us from generating an estimated $1 trillion through solar, wind, and traditional energy resources. Remove the barriers that prevent us from restoring tribal land bases according to our priorities. Our lands made the United States what it is. Our wisdom will continue to sustain it, just as our wisdom played a role in creating it. <clears throat> we know something about governing. We were peoples before we the people. Our proven ways of governing informed the governing approach forged by this country's founders. The United States Senate acknowledged this fact in 1987, declaring, and I quote, the Congress, on the occasion of the 200th anniversary of the signing of the United States Constitution, acknowledges the contribution made by the Iroquois Confederacy and other Indian nations to the formation and development of the United States, end quote. <clears throat> Tribal governments have always held a unique place in the American family of governments. Hundreds of treaties and laws and the Constitution itself all affirm the inherent sovereignty our tribes possess. We should never forget that when tribal nations agreed to accept a smaller land base, the federal government promised to safeguard our right to govern ourselves to enable tribal governments to deliver essential services and provide them ample resources to do so effectively, to help us manage our own lands and resources for the betterment of our communities. That is the trust relationship embodied in the United States Constitution. Every member of Congress and every federal official is responsible for carrying out that trust. It's not a handout, it's a contract. And it's best upheld. <clears throat> and it's best upheld when decisions are made at the local tribal level by values-based governments that know the circumstances, challenges, and priorities of local communities. Tribal decision-making not only benefits tribal communities, it benefits everyone. For example, the Puyallup tribe opened up its clinic in the Tacoma, Washington metro area to provide care for the entire community, including non-native people. My own Chickasaw Nation established a cutting-edge diabetes care center to provide holistic health and preventive care, providing a model for clinics everywhere. Two decades ago, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes took over management of its timber. The federal government, which manages an adjacent forest, barely breaks even on its timber sales. Meanwhile, the tribes made $2 on every dollar they spend, profit that they reinvest in their local communities. That's why every American should make this demand of their own government. 
appreciate and honor the inherent sovereign rights of tribal nations, respect our right to govern ourselves and our lands, respect our unique political status as real nations with capable governments as enshrined in laws, in treaties, and in the Constitution of the United States. <clears throat> Top-down government has been tried. It's time to go back to working with us. Those are our priorities. Now I want to share three basic principles to guide decision-making by policymakers to make those priorities a reality. First, the first principle is to honor and affirm the federal tribal relationship. This goes back to the very beginning of the United States. Tribal governments have always worked directly with the federal government, not through state governments. <clears throat> that direct nation-to-nation -nation relationship must always be maintained. Right now, Congress is thinking about shifting more authority and funding to states on the theory that states can more efficiently spend those funds. We, too, believe in local decision-making. We've been doing it for thousands of years. The second principle is to engage tribal nations on all matters of national policy that potentially impact them. Not only is it the right thing to do, not only does it make everyone better off, it's also the law. <clears throat> The tribal consultation policies of federal agencies reflect that fact. Two recent laws illustrate when the federal government takes its obligation to consult seriously and when it doesn't. I want to start with the one that failed to meet our standard of consultation, the recent tax overhaul. For, tech, for decades, tribal leaders have advocated for the same set of tax priorities. We met often with members of Congress. We offered thoughtful, pragmatic, deficit-neutral policy proposals. But the bill came together in a flurry. And when the dust settled, Indian Country's top priorities were absent from the version the President signed in December. That is completely unacceptable. Today, we call on federal policymakers to consult tribes on all major national policies and to take that responsibility seriously. In 2018, that means setting things right by taking action on Indian Country's tax priorities. A former our authority to regulate taxes and commerce on our own lands with the same degree of freedom that local and state governments enjoy allow us to use tax-exempt bonds the same way that other governments do, exempt tribes from federal excise taxes in the same way that states are exempted. All we want is a level playing field. That's only fair, and it's not too much to ask. Like other governments, tribes are an essential part of building a sustainable 21st century American economy and we contribute best when we chart our own paths. <clears throat> the third principle I want to discuss is reflected in the other positive example of recent legis legislation passed by Congress. Not only was it a product of meaningful consultation with and input from tribal nations, it enacts the proven principle that tribal self-determination and self-governance is the only policy that has ever worked for Indian country. I'm talking about the Indian Employment, Training, and Related Services Consolidation Act, which expands the tribal workforce development program known as 477 and makes it permanent. Under 477, tribal nations and native organizations can choose to consolidate up to 13 federal programs into a single process with a single reporting requirement while still addressing distinct 
local needs and priorities. To date, more than 260 tribal nations and native organizations have taken advantage of 477, enhancing program efficiency and effectiveness and making real impacts in the lives of native people. Lives like Nicole Manzano's. At the age of 25, Nicole had been a caregiver for her grandmother for many years. Her grandmother's death was a huge blow, and Nicole had to deal with her grief while building a new life with little work experience. She came to Citizen Potawatomi Workforce and Social Services, where 477 tethered programs gave her access to training in resume building, applying, and interviewing. She got a full-time job, and assistance with gas vouchers, clothing, and basic food until she became financially stable. Stories like Nicole's prove that enhancing 477 is smart policy. It affirms that the program has been a success and could be an even greater one. But we shouldn't stop there. We should use this model, which puts tribal nations and communities in the driver's seat where they belong. <clears throat> We should use it as a model to replicate all across other areas of federal Indian policy. Put simply, tribal self-determination and self-governance works. This is a message that we must continue to bring to those in leadership. My fellow Native citizens, the most powerful way to assert our right to determine our own destinies is on Election Day. Close elections happen. Just last month, candidates in, uh, for one Virginia State House seat earned the same number of votes, a tie. They decided the election by drawing a name from a bowl. The native vote can be the deciding vote in dozens of close races in 2018. In fact, the native vote has the potential to swing elections for federal, state, and local offices across this country. We will support the candidates who respect the inherent sovereign rights we possess and who recognize the value we have to offer, who support tribal sovereignty, self-governance, consultation, and meeting the trust responsibility. Elected officials must hear our voices and heed our priorities because we will be watching and we will be voting. <clears throat> As one of the fast-growing populations in this country, our vote more and more is becoming a swing vote that candidates must engage. We have our voice and our vote, and in 2018, we'll exercise it like never before. As it has been for thousands of years, the state of Indian nation is strong and everlasting. We'll be here forever. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you, President Kiel, for that inspiring statement on the strength and resilience of tribal nations. We've invited a member of Congress to do the congressional response to the state of Indian nations. And this year, we are very pleased to be joined by Senator Tom Udall. Senator Udall is the senior U.S. Senator for New Mexico and currently serves as the Vice Chairman for the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. During Senator Udall's long career in public service, he has been a strong advocate for the tribes of New Mexico, as well as reaching outside of his district to address tribal issues nationally. Through his position as the ranking member for the Interior Appropriations Subcommittee, Senator Udall works to ensure that the federal government's trust obligation to Indian tribes remains constant and is not subject to partisan political pressures in Washington. Please join me 
in welcoming Senator Tom Udall. <laughs> Thank you, Jackie, very much for that very kind introduction and for your hard work on behalf of NCAI day in and day out. And I, I want to applaud President Keel for his powerful remarks. President, Mr. President, President Keel, I look forward to working with you on every single one of those, and we can go hand in hand to make sure they get done. Thank you very much. I was here listening to them, and they were great. NCI is very um, fortunate to have his leadership, and I welcome him, uh, I, and I echo him also in welcoming the 573 federally recognized tribes. Congratulations to our six newly recognized Virginia tribes. Their decades of work for official acknowledgement finally came to fruition last month. It is a great honor for me to be here today. And it is a great honor to serve as the ranking member of the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs. It is a tremendous responsibility, and I take it seriously every day. Legislating is tricky business, and in this Congress, it requires compromise. You have to know when to give, and you have to know when to stand your ground. As Vice Chairman, three core principles guide my committee work. Number one, respecting tribal sovereignty. Number, thank you. Number two, promoting tribal self-determination. And three, ensuring that meaningful government-to-government -government consultation happens when federal action affects Indian country. When I prepare legislation that affects Indian country, I work to stay true to these principles. This means acknowledging that tribal sovereignty is written into the Constitution, reflected in treaties, and codified in federal law. Listening to, consulting, and engaging tribes whenever federal legislation affects your interests. And making sure that tribes retain the authority to make decisions themselves. For over 40 years, tribes have exercised their rights to self-determination, and self-governance over federal programs under the ISDEAA. Decisions made for Indians by Indians produce the best outcomes for the unique needs, cultures, and beliefs of their communities. President Keel's address poignantly recognized the challenges Indian country faces, but it also recognized your successes and determination in uncertain times. I appreciate that sentiment, and I pledge that I will do my very best to elevate and achieve your legislative priorities. We are just over the halfway mark in the 115th Congress, and the committee is working in a number of policy areas, and I want to discuss a few of them with you. The first is the Violence Against Women Act, or VAWA. The 2013 amendments to VAWA were groundbreaking. They restored tribal authority to exercise their sovereign powers to investigate, prosecute, and sentence non-Indians who assault spouses or partners in Indian country. VAWA 2013 was a critical step toward making sure that tribes have jurisdiction to prosecute certain crimes committed on tribal lands. However, there is more to do. Tribes still can't prosecute non-Indian offenders whose domestic violence crimes also hurt children and law enforcement <clears throat> officers on tribal lands. VALWA implementing tribes tell us that these specific crimes often occur together, and they ask Congress to address this gap. To that end, I introduced the Native Youth and Tribal Officer Protection Act, a bipartisan bill that builds on the 2013 VAWA provisions. Thank you. Thanks. Public safety and its relationship to tribal self-determination in Indian country 
is a top priority for the committee. And we are working together on a bipartisan basis to tackle these issues. Second, the survival and continuing vitality of native languages is of utmost importance. Last November, the Senate passed my Esther Martinez Native Languages Preservation Act. This bill is named for an Okeo Wingay Pueblo traditional storyteller and language advocate. She dedicated her life to revitalizing the Tewa language, and my bill honors her and reauthorizes federal Native American language programs through 2023. <laughs> it has wide bipartisan support, and I am working with my House colleagues and encouraging them to take swift action. And I urge you to call your representatives and ask them to do their part to reauthorize this very important program. The principles, the principles I laid out at the beginning of this speech require the Indian Affairs Committee to elevate tribal priorities in all possible venues. The Farm Bill is one example, and I know President Keel mentioned that. Tribal lands, natural resources, foods, and economic development opportunities are all affected by federal food policy. But for many decades now, Indian country has been excluded from both the discussions that shape these policies and the policies themselves. That is unacceptable. Last month, Chairman Hoven and I convened a hearing on native agribusiness opportunities, and we led a bipartisan roundtable to discuss the many ways Congress and the USDA can support tribal efforts to emphasize traditional foods. I expect a robust dialogue between tribes, the USDA, and Congress on how Indian country's priorities should be reflected in the next Farm Bill. I'm pleased to be working with the chairman on a bipartisan bill that does just that. For too long, Indian country has been knocking at the door of each new farm bill negotiation. They have been asking for a seat at the table with states, counties, and other stakeholders, and asking for their due as sovereign governments. We need to all come together to push that door open and make room at the table. Last week, I also reintroduced a bill to add federally recognized tribes to the list of governments authorized to administer child nutrition programs. This would enable tribes to provide services directly without going through states. It would be a small step toward combating childhood hunger and obesity at the reservation level. One Farm Bill initiative I strongly support is Promise Zones. A handful of tribes across the country have been recipients of these awards which emphasize tribal economic self-determination. And I will push to keep them working for Indian country. Let <laughs> and let's not forget infrastructure. In an increasingly interconnected economy, we must include access to high-speed internet in our discussions to improve and strengthen our inf infrastructure. I want to emphasize my support for President Keel's words about tribal energy independence. Transmission and energy development are two ways tribes can achieve energy independence. This is an ambitious goal, but I believe it is achievable. Last year, we had the fight of our lives in Congress over health care. Native communities would have been hit hard. I made sure that my Senate colleagues understood that repealing the Affordable Care Act would be devastating to Indian country. And I will continue to fight just as hard for fulfillment of the trust responsibility. <laughs> the, the Special Diabetes Program for Indians, or SDPI, is especially important. SDPI has been wildly effective, holding down the rates of diabetes, 
and dramatically decreasing the rates of kidney failure and limb amputation due to illness. I held a roundtable in Albuquerque two weekends ago focused on SDPI. Fortunately, with the assistance of more than my more than capable Indian Affairs staff, headed up by Jennifer Rometto, who's also here with me, and I believe at some place, there she is, right there. Okay, great, Jennifer. Thank you. If you haven't met her, you've got to meet her. Um, I, the, um, the, in this roundtable, we were able uh, to make sure that SDPI was included in the budget deal. I am pleased to report that it is now reauthorized for two years, and I promise you that we will keep pushing for longer and increased, increased authorizations for SDPI. I'm also fighting for resources to help Indian Country address the devastating toll of opioid addiction and substance abuse. We can win the battle against addiction, but we must, yes, we must invest. We must invest real resources and action, not just lip service. We must ensure that anyone who wants treatment can get it. I commit to working with Indian Country to push for tribal set-asides to combat and address opioid addiction and substance abuse, particularly as we head toward the next funding deadline over the next few weeks and in any future budget deal coming out of the Senate. Unfortunately, protecting public lands has been highly controversial and often highly partisan. This administration has waged an unprecedented attack on public lands. Bears Ears National Monument in Utah, which is home to more than 100,000 cultural and archaeological sites, has been ground zero for this fight. Five tribes, the Navajo Nation, Hopi Tribe, Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, Pueblo of Zuni, and the Ute Mountain Indian Tribe, worked for years to defend this sacred area, only to have the administration remove protections for 85% of the monument in December. After consulting with tribal leaders and organizations, I introduced legislation, the Antiquities Act of 2018, that would reaffirm the boundaries set forth in the monument designation since 1996. And in New Mexico, I'm partnering with the Navajo Nation and the All Pueblo Council of Governors to push back against unchecked leasing around Chaco Culture National Historic Park. These leases impact tribal land, homes, ancient ruins, and cultural sites. For a number of these parcels, the federal government is literally leasing the federal minerals out from underneath tribal lands without meaningful tribal consultation. That is absolutely unacceptable. Whether in Chaco Canyon or Bear Sears, I'm doing everything I can in the Senate to partner with tribes to protect sacred places for generations to come. So much has been accomplished, as President Keel said, and there is still much more to do. Thank you again for the honor of speaking here today, and I commit to you to continue to try to do right by Indian country and to hold fast to the principles of tribal sovereignty, self-determination, and meaningful consultation. Thank you so much. Great to be here with you today. Thank you. Please join me in thanking Senator Udall again for his comments today. At this time, we'd like to welcome questions from the press here in the studio audience. Please raise your hand, and if you have a question, one of the staff will bring a handheld microphone to you. Please state your name and who you represent. And for those of you who are watching live stream, uh, uh, there's a chat function and the social media hashtag use SOIN2018 
for questions. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Wait for the microphone, please. Good morning. I'm Maxine Hillary with Native Sun News. I'm concerned about the pipeline issues. It seems to have had a lot of high profile previously, and it's gotten a little bit quiet. So maybe you can speak a little bit about that to us. Thank you. Sure. So um, there's a number of pipeline issues, and there's also a number of other um, impacts that uh, water impacts and other impacts that are happening across the, the country. In fact, our board um, just passed three resolutions just yesterday at our board meeting um, in environmentally related issues. But they all stem from one of the biggest concerns, which was something that President Keel talked about in his speech today, which was the importance of engagement with tribal leaders early, tribal governments early, on consultation. There are federal responsibilities in the permitting process that it, in, that it has a responsibility to engage the tribes. And we believe that when tribes are engaged early, that you can seek responsible solutions. Tribes are not anti-development, but they also are very concerned about, the, um, about their land and the environment and their impacts to their own communities. So on that front, um, NCAI has been working with a coalition. We have a, actually started a lands working group. Um, we will continue to pursue um, trying to come up with stronger processes and engagement with the federal government to fulfill their, their legal responsibility and obligations for consultation regarding those issues. Any other questions? Yes. Mark. Mark Trahant, uh, Trahant Reports. So um, Medicaid has become a critical funding stream for the Indian health system, and states are adding new requirements and work uh, rules. Is it time for tribes to have a direct route? Well, you're talking to me, and I would say yes, and here comes President Kiel. He said yes, too. <laughs> we have this idea, and I'll let President Kiel speak, um, but we have this idea that, you know, early when there was the, we were having the difficulties with Medicaid and we were trying to get more states to sign on and to engage, that perhaps tribes should have a 51st state where we would get direct funding through that way. But President Kiel, he's an expert on health. <laughs> <laughs> now she really set me up. But... <clears throat> No, you're absolutely right. The the question is a great question for, uh, not just for me, but for tribal leaders. I, I think uh, tribal nations and, and tribal governments across this country have proven that they can manage these these resources in a in a not just a comprehensive way, but a a way that that benefits all of our citizens. Um, Medicare, Medicaid, uh, all of those things that are funneled, or like Medicaid is a state. Uh, operated uh, funding stream, uh, but when you start looking at, at how Native peoples are affected, we have uh, relationships with, with the state Medicaid offices, uh, the state departments of health, that benefits all of our people. And so, yes, it, it is time for, for those, those funding mechanisms to go directly to tribes, those tribes that are willing uh, to uh, take on that responsibility. Tribes, some tribes may choose not to, but that's their sovereign right. But but it, it, it would, as, as she mentioned, a 51st state type of organization or type of arrangement would definitely work. Just as Indian Health Service has a, a relationship with the VA, you know, there, there are ways that we can work with, with CMS um, and and operate those um, those programs in an efficient way that benefits all of our citizens. And I'm going to go to a question online. Um, how is Indian education being empowered, and are there policies in process? So on that, I, I wanted to say that one of the good things that Indian country fought hard for, <coughs> tribal leaders fought hard for, was the engagement in ESSA, the Every Student Succeeds Act, to ensure that tribal governments had the same rights as other governments to be there at local education policy. And so now states across the country have a requirement to consult with tribes and to be able to make sure that tribes are at the table. This gives a great opportunity for tribal leaders to be more engaged in those educational decisions that are made in their own local communities. And now we're faced with an environment where there's talk about student uh, school choice. 
And NCAI is engaging with tribal leaders. We've held several sessions in the last couple of conferences and plan on having another one in our June meeting. As we explore with tribal governments and tribal leaders, what are the things that they need to know? What are the decisions that they need to make? And what are the tools that they need to help make those decisions? What will school choice look like in Indian country? Next question. Oh, we have a question back up there. Uh, hi, my name is Janie Pochal. I'm with the Shine Nations Youth Council out of Chicago. Um, my question is, I noticed that there wasn't much talk about urban natives or off-reservation natives. Um, what does that mean for us when all of our funding has been cut, especially in urban centers, and we have to actually go to the reservation to access a lot of the, the rights or a lot of our um, like health care and stuff uh, and education? Like We have to leave our homes and go back, even though we're, most of us are still on our ancestral homelands. What does that look like if we have to travel across the country to get access to these things? Thank you for that question. That is a, an, an important question, not only for, um, for your situation, but across this country, we have uh, native uh, people who reside now in urban areas out, outside of these old historic uh, tribal boundaries. Uh, there are some, um, I, I would say, uh, urban health centers that are uh, inadequate. They're not, they're not funded. And, and that population, by the way, the urban Indian population is growing. That's where people go to find jobs, to find ways to support themselves and their families. And uh, we, we are working. I know that tribes across the country, I know it doesn't sound like it today, but we are working with, with uh, members of Congress and, and uh, uh, other representatives to make sure that we get an adequate funding stream for uh, those uh, residents or those native people who reside in urban areas. But it's a, it's a slow process, and I know it, it's, uh, doesn't, uh, that doesn't fit your needs right now, but we will continue to work on that. Um, there are... I know in Oklahoma, in the Oklahoma City area, there are three um, urban health centers, one in Tulsa, um, one in Dallas, I believe, and one, one in Oklahoma City, and there may be one in Wichita. I may have, uh, may have misspoken. But we do work with them to try to make sure that they are, uh, they do have the resources that they need uh, to, to handle the, the uh, needs of the people that come to them for services. And it's not just a particular tribe. These, these people who've come from ur in, into urban areas from, are from tribes across the country. So uh, it, it's a very difficult uh, situation that we're faced with, but we are working on it. We have a question over here. Um, Good morning. L Levi Rickert, Native News Online. I have a question relating to the uh, Labor and Sovereignty Act. Mm -hmm. It appears that we're about two to three votes short in the Congress. How can we get the Democrats, what is NCI doing to convince the Democrats that they need to um, respect sovereignty over uh, convenience? Well, I think it's really important that, you know, um, if you go back to the principle about what the Tribal Labor Sovereignty Act is, it is the recognition of tribal governments, just as all other governments, for the purposes of making laws and ordinances around how unions engage, um, what labor laws look like for the tribe. Tribes have been exercising that for, you know, 70 plus years before the NLRA, um, NLRB made the decision that they made. The important part for Democrats is, and, and I, I don't even want to say just Democrats, any member of Congress that makes a decision, that this is really about the recognition of tribal sovereignty. This does not have anything to say about how, uh, about employment rights. Employment rights, tribes just cons j care just as much about employment rights as any other employer or any other government. Tribes want to be able to make sure that the people who work in their, in their communities and work for their governments and their government or enterprises are sustained, that they won't be shut down, that they will have just as many rights as any, and as any other right, anybody else's rights. But it's important that our tribal governments are protected just like any other governments from perhaps um, closure because of um, 
uh, disagreements um, with the union. Our governments, our fire departments, our police forces, our schools need to operate just like other governments. And all we're asking for is, is, tribal, is parity in tribal labor sovereignty. Yes. Yeah, yeah. We have another question online. Um, w the question right now is, um, how can we work with local, state, and federal governments to rid mascots that speak for our youth before they can speak for themselves? So um, as you know, NCAI has been working on the mascot issue. Great win with Cleveland. Um, and we're, uh, um, you know, we're excited that um, that was the first step to get rid of a derogatory um, mascot. Um, hopefully, we'll continue to work down that line, and maybe there'll be other teams that will follow suit across the country. I have to say that we are winning. We have thousands of schools across the country have had these difficult conversations and have turned to make right, right decisions. So at this point, I think what you're hearing is and seeing that the younger generation is engaged in wanting to see change happen, that they want to be able to make that their friends, their neighbors, the people they go to school with, don't have to go to school in an environment where there is a disparaging mascot or that their friends have to feel that they've been disrespected in a school assembly or even at a sports game. Let me add one thing to that, too, and, and it's a different perspective. When we talk about mascots, um, and, and I know that there are, there are those uh, across the country that who, who feel that, well, in, in some ways, maybe the Native people were being honored, or we were honoring their, um, their warrior uh, pride or whatever. And, and we appreciate those, those thoughts. But what if, and just imagine this, what if, um, a school had a, d decided to use a mascot using um, another derogatory term, such as the N-word or other types of, of derogatory uh, statements. What, how would the community, local communities, and those people who are represented by that, by that word or that uh, stereotype or whatever, how would they feel? And what then would be the actions that were taken? What kind of uprising would we see across this country to, to change that? That's what we're, we're working on. So just, just a thought. That's my thought. We have time for one last question, Vincent. Is it on? Can you yes. hear me? OK. I, I just have a very weak, brief question. First of all, I wanted to say phenomenal uh, speech, President Keel. Thank you so much. Uh, I felt very empowered, especially the vote part and coming out uh, in, in numbers. Uh, just wanted to be curious, what would you would say to maybe some of the younger people who have been essentially written out? Uh, last administration had Center for Native American Youth see things like the Tribal Council uh, at uh, the White House, you know, tribal gathering for youth. Um, what would you say to young people today that maybe aren't even of voting age that are watching something? There's parties everywhere watching. I mean, what would you say to those youth? What can they do? <laughs> okay, we, we're very short of time. To those young people watching, get involved. Stay involved. Look at what's going on around you. Uh, if you want to be part of, of what's happening, you can do that. And we look forward to working with you to help you with that. Give us a call so we can empower you and work with you to, to make those things happen. Thank you. And that's all the time that we have for questions today. Um, if we weren't able to answer your question, please connect with a member of our staff that are here. Or if you can continue to submit questions online, don't forget. Um, hashtag SOIN 2018, or you can also send your um, questions through Facebook or Twitter. NCAI encourages you to learn more about our work by going to our website, www.ncai.org, and look at our website for publications and other resources. They may have lots of their rich resources that can answer some of the questions that you may have. Thank you again for attending the 2018 State of Indian Nations. Thank you. Thank you.